Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Ask Shane Anything. Now, right off the bat, I'm going to let you know this episode is going to be a little bit shorter than typical. Um, I got a bunch of stuff going on today. My schedule's really tight today. I also have another sister coming into town to hang out with me for the weekend. So it's going to be a little bit shorter, but still answering four questions and still pretty awesome questions. Now, again, this show is a reward for those of you who pledge at $7 or more per month at that Ask Shane tier. Now, everybody gets to watch it. But if it weren't for those people pledging at $7 or more per month, this show would not happen. So either thank the people who are pledging at that amount or pledge at that amount yourself. Let's get to those questions. First up, we have a question and a seasonal one from AJ the Legend. What horror games would you suggest be played between now and Halloween? And what is your favorite video game horror franchise? Okay, so oddly enough, even though this month, October, is a crazy release month as far as the number of really high-quality games, surprisingly, there aren't that many high-profile horror games for Halloween 2023. However, there is one, and that is Alan Wake 2. Now, we just talked about it on Game Face this week. Matt's not that excited for it. I kind of am. I do like survival horror, obviously. I talk about it all the time on Game Face. Also really love horror movies. Sadly, really not a lot of big top shelf horror games coming in October. But if I had to recommend one, it would definitely be Alan Wake 2. I think it comes out like four or five days before Halloween. Um, So you should have enough time to get most of it complete before the holiday gets here. So I guess that's one that I would recommend. But there's a bunch of others too that came out earlier in the year that I should definitely recommend that you play and first on top of the list is the resident evil 4 remake if you haven't played that yet what are you doing (laughs) i mean the good news there really though is that if you have waited now there's the awesome separate ways dlc with ada wong that you can play um and i haven't even played that yet but i did play the base game and i absolutely loved it so i recommend resident evil 4 um i think most people who played it would recommend it it's really really good Next up, I would guess I would recommend De- the Dead Space remake. I will say I was a little disappointed in the Dead Space remake. And I think what it was was that I realized that the original Dead Space wasn't as great as I remembered it to be. Still really good, though. And you can probably find it for pretty cheap at this point. It didn't do particularly well at retail. My guess is you can probably find it on discount. Definitely worth playing, particularly if you didn't play the original game way back in the early aughts. So I would say... Dead Space Remake, although that's on the fringes for me. Another one you might consider, though, if you don't want to spend money and you just want to get spooked out, is Callisto Protocol. Now, this was Striking Distance's first game, Glenn Schofield, who actually created the original Dead Space. This was his attempt at reviving the same concept with a new IP. It really did poorly with critics and at retail, and consequently, Glenn left Striking Distance almost two weeks ago, I guess it was now, something like that. So, ultimately... Not a great game, kind of doomed a studio. However, if you are a PlayStation Plus subscriber, it is free this month. And in that case, I would definitely recommend giving it a play. At the very least, play the first three or four hours of it, get spooked out, and then put it down. Um, I finished the game. I don't think most people will probably make it to the end of Callisto Protocol. But again, as just a bonus on your PlayStation Plus subscription, it's kind of easy for me to recommend. As far as my favorite horror franchise, I think mine is the same as everybody's. It's Resident Evil. Um, It's just been a part of my life for so long at this point, ever since the original came out in the mid to late 90s. I have enjoyed pretty much every entry in the franchise. There are some that I like more than others, and there are some that I liked when I played them originally, and now I play them now, and I'm like, oh my gosh, was that? must have been insane. I think Resident Evil Code Veronica comes to mind uh, when I'm talking about that specifically. Uh, But generally, I have really enjoyed every entry in the Resident Evil franchise, and I think that's been backed up by all these remakes that have come out that have been amazing. Um, And I'm tied into the mythos and the story and all the characters and all the locations and just all of it. So I think most people would say Resident Evil. I am not an outlier in that regard. I think Resident Evil is the best horror franchise in the video game industry. Next up, we have a question from Neo JD. Have you ever seen the show The Amazing Race? I know you and your wife like to travel. Ever considered signing up for it? If not, what other game show would you like to be on? (laughs) Okay, that's that's a pretty interesting question. Um, Of course, I've seen The Amazing Race. I 
think I watched half a season of it, like right when it launched, like a long time ago. I've watched Survivor. I've watched all the MTV reality shows, the all the challenge stuff. Um, believe it or not, even though I don't really watch reality TV now, I have watched a lot of it in the past because I was kind of the generation that was the first to really experience reality TV with the real world on MTV. And we're kind of the generation that got everybody hooked into reality TV. And now it's up to you guys to carry the torch because I think most people my age don't watch a lot of reality TV anymore, myself included. Um, but I am aware of all those shows. So yes, I know The Amazing Race. Um, I don't think it would work for us, <laughs> honestly. Hustling and bustling around is something that you'd kind of do organically when you're on vacation, particularly when you go overseas to Europe or someplace like that. It's always a rush. Like you're always like getting to the hotel, staying there for two days, packing your stuff up, you know, schlepping to the train, getting on the train, going to the next location, rinse and repeat. So it is a little bit of a hustle, but I think The Amazing Race would just be too much of a hustle, honestly. Um, and no, I've never applied to try to be on any of those shows. I really wouldn't want my privacy invaded anyway. Like, I don't even care how much money is on the line for winning these things or any of that stuff. It's just not worth being exposed to America. And in all, in all honesty, putting my persona in the hands of TV producers having worked in television, I think that's a terrible idea. Um, so no, I'm not really interested in it. However, I will say that my sister-in-law did apply for Survivor one time, and we kind of helped her. Uh, she put together like this video of her like doing crazy stuff in the outdoors and blah 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 and i think she made it past the first couple screens and then like the third round or whatever she ended up getting cut or whatever so she tried um if i could be on any game show what would it be um i have an affinity for the price is right <laughs> and that's simply because when i was young uh, my mom would go to work and she would take me to my grandma's house my grammy and um, every day she watched The Price is Right. And I would sit and watch The Price is Right with her. So I have great memories. And obviously that was when Bob Barker was the host or whatever. So I have an affinity for The Price is Right. However, my favorite game show without a doubt is Family Feud. <laughs> I just think, I think Steve Harvey's funny. He's just genuinely funny. And um, I just love the dynamic of the families going head to head and then the families competing within each other. I love all that stuff. However, I have pitched this idea to my wife and she says, no way. <laughs> I'm like, I, I just think it would be hilarious to have myself and my wife and our family on a game show and just have it for posterity's sake. Um, I think it would be hilarious and a lot of fun, uh, but no one else seems to agree with me, so I don't think it's ever going to happen, unfortunately. <laughs> Next up, we have a question from Khalib Twali, and I think I finally said it the right way. Is there a recipe you're known for doing particularly well? What's the story behind it, and why are you the best at making it? Oh, I have a couple things that I'm kind of known for making. I would say the first one is my wings. Um, I make hot wings with a special hot sauce that I make from scratch. Um, I've never told anyone what the recipe is for it. I haven't even told my wife. And she has reached like the breaking point with it where she's like, just tell me. Like, I'll make them for you. The problem is that... Um, you know, I was told a few years ago that I have, I was getting high cholesterol and I needed to change my diet. And so I used to love hot wings and I still do. I just can't hardly eat them anymore. I get like one cheat day a week um, where I can actually eat something that has cholesterol in it. And sometimes it's wings, sometimes it's a hamburger, but it ends up being that I probably eat wings now once every month and a half or two months, maybe something like that. Um, so I don't eat them as often, but my recipe is bomb. Everybody who eats my wings is like, man, you guys, you should sell these. So I'm not going to tell you what the recipe is either, but that is one of my most famous recipes. And then another thing that I made that uh, people love is filet mignon tacos. Now, I understand a lot of people hear that and they're like, oh, my God, you're going to put filet mignon in tacos? You should just eat the steak. I totally get that, but I'm telling you, man, my filet mignon tacos are to die for. So I take filet, I make sure I get good cuts, and I slice it up very thin. Um, and then what I do is I saute it with this papa this spicy papaya sauce. You can get this anywhere. Like brand names make it, and there's almost always like a generic version at the store too. You would not think that it would make great talk. It makes amazing tacos. And it's not that difficult. Like literally just slice up the filet mignon very thin in pieces about that long, throw it in a pan, saute it with that papaya sauce, and then put all the other stuff on the tacos you normally do. And it is amazing. Um, 
that sauce is good with anything, by the way. There's a reason it's in the stores. Like, you see it and you're like, who would ever use that? Well, if you try it, it is awesome. So if I have two things that I make that people either ask me for or I feel like I'm pretty good at, it's those two. Also, I make a really good buffalo chicken dip. And every fantasy draft that I'm invited to, everybody requests that I bring my buffalo chicken dip. It's not that I have some crazy secret recipe for it. I take a base recipe and I make some tweaks to it. Um, but buffalo ch chicken dip is just delicious. I don't think it matters who makes it, uh, but I do get requests for that anytime somebody knows that I'm coming to an event or I'm coming to a fantasy draft or to watch football or anything like that. So I guess those are the three things that I'm really known for making. All right, our last question for this week's episode of Ask Shane Anything comes from Kevin. In Game Face, you talked about how the RoboCop game surprised you. Which few games had previously done? Do you remember when a game has surprised you in a similar manner before? Okay, first of all, if I said that I hadn't really been pleasantly surprised by games before, I misspoke. I don't remember saying that, but if I did, I misspoke because I have been surprised by games consistently. I mean, if you look at it, we have um, we have a category in our Game of the Year awards called Most Pleasant Surprise for that very reason, because every year there's at least one or two games where you're like, dang, I never expected that. So I have tons, honestly. Like there's every year there's at least two or three games that I'm like, wow, like that really caught me off guard. I love that about the industry is that somehow every year there's a few games that completely catch me off guard and end up being awesome um here's the ones that come from the top of my mind but literally there's just dozens i could go through the first one is sleeping dogs it is like a grand theft auto clone set in like a korean martial arts movie i guess is the best way to put it it did a bunch of unique stuff that other open world games haven't done, other GTA clones haven't done. The one that sticks out the most to me, though, is the environmental interaction. You could use the environments and objects that you find in the environment in the combat. It's seamlessly integrated. A lot of times they just happen on accident. You just be like, whoa, like, I didn't see that coming at all. Uh, it was really, really cool. Now, the story in the game... Not as good as Grand Theft Auto, that's to be sure, but that's a high bar to clear. It was good enough, um, and it managed to nail most of the other elements of the genre, the open world, action, adventure, whatever. So um, I think Sleeping Dogs is one. Another one is a pretty common one that I'll bring up that a lot of people mention, and that's Spec Ops The Line. Um, back when that game came out, we were getting like military shooters literally like three a month. It was just total overload. And I think everybody had just kind of glazed over when it came to games like that. And that was one, it's like, I remember they came and previewed it for us. And they did show something that I was like, whoa, that's kind of weird. Like they showed the phosphorus attack. Um, and that was kind of one of those things at the time that was like taboo. Um, using weapons in video games that would give real countries war crimes that typically didn't happen in video games at that point. But Spec Ops was like, oh, no, no, we're going to use it. And not only that, it also explored kind of the psychology of the soldier. It was very gritty and unflinching. It was just one of those games that kind of just threw conventions to the wind. And I would say reinvigorated the military shooter a great deal. However, I am a little disappointed that other developers and publishers haven't followed suit. Um, so it still stands. It's kind of this anomaly um, of a game that was not afraid to kind of stretch the boundaries and push the envelope a little bit uh, mil on military shooters. So Spec Ops The Line is another one. Um, Alpha Protocol from Obsidian, it was this weird kind of modern day RPG. Uh, it's hard to even put into words. The game tanked so horribly. It reviewed okay. The problem was that it, it technically had a lot of issues. I remember talking to, I believe it was Miguel Lopez who reviewed that for us at Game Trailers, I think. And I remember having the conversation about it. He's like, there's so many bugs and issues in this game. It almost feels like it's broken at times, but it's so different from anything else that's out there. And so it's tough to kind of find that middle ground and figure out where to score it and stuff like that. I remember that very specifically. Um, but I think in hindsight, it's one of those games that people look back on now and they're like, oh, that was one of those games that really kind of pushed things in a new direction. But again, we have it. And I think a lot of it is because it failed. Just like Spec Ops The Line, it didn't sell especially well. And that is usually what really convinces developers and publishers to kind of follow this new trend or whatever is sales and unfortunately alpha protocol completely bombed um and obsidian was like well we're not gonna make another one and i doubt anyone else will ever make a game like it again either that's one to keep an eye on though if you find if you're like digging through like bargain bins or whatever if you come across alpha protocol make sure you snag it and pick it up it might even be worth some money at this point because again it didn't sell very well uh, another one is darksiders 
Uh, I'm a big Zelda fan, a fan of the traditional Zelda games with dungeons and all that that jazz. Um, and let's be honest, like even now, there really aren't any traditional Zelda clones. Back then, there weren't either, and Darksiders was the closest thing to a Zelda game that you could get. Plus, it was angled a little bit more towards older audiences. Like, I wouldn't mind playing a Zelda-style game that's crazy violent and just gritty. We really haven't got that. Darksiders was kind of the first step towards that. Um, both of the first two games ended up being really good. I think that's an underappreciated franchise. It probably should have done a lot better than it actually did back in the day. Uh, another one that comes to mind is Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons. That game really showed me how the that the boundaries of cooperative play could be stretched into areas that, that I had never had anticipated or dreamed of. Um, truly one of the best cooperative games ever. Also, one of the most emotional games ever. Like, I expected so little from that, and I was just blown away by what I played. I think a lot of people would say Demon Souls or Dark Souls. Now, I wouldn't because I don't really like those games, but I think for a lot of people, those two games were pleasant surprises. Demon Souls to a smaller segment, Dark Souls to a bigger segment of players. I think a lot of people were like, holy crap, what is this? Even though Demon Souls had come before it, people just didn't know about it. And they found Dark Souls and were like, what is this? Like, this is awesome. Um, again, not for me, but I think a lot of other people would feel that way. And then my final pick would be a weird RPG for the Nintendo 64 called Hybrid Heaven. It was a melee-focused action RPG. Well, it's a turn-based RPG, actually, where you fought with your fists and your feet in turn-based battles, and you picked, like, specific, like, body parts to attack. It, again, there was never an RPG like it before that. There's never been an RPG like it since. It was one of those games, too, for the N64 that, like, appeared in magazines before the console launched. Everybody's like, what is that? Hybrid Heaven, that looks cool. Because it was one of the few games that looked like it was targeted towards older players, which was a big thing back then. The N64 kitty console versus the PlayStation adult console. So if you, for N64 fans, they really latched onto that game because it looked like it was like Metal Gear or something. As it turns out, it was something completely insane, but still kind of awesome. And again, it didn't sell especially well, so we never got a sequel, but my honorable mention, is hybrid heaven thanks for watching this episode of ask shane anything as i said it was a little shorter than normal but you guys did ask great questions speaking of which we're starting to get a little thin on questions for ask shane anything it's kind of turning into this thing where a new episode goes up and then we get just enough questions to do the next week's episode so if you decided to sit it out for the last month or so might be a good time to get back in there and ask some questions again there's a link at the header in the header at sifted.net that'll take you to our forums where you can ask questions 24 7 365 so have a good weekend playing games if you're on that call of duty modern warfare 3 beta i'm dinfire add me maybe we can play together um, or maybe you're just waiting for marvel spider-man 2 or super mario brothers wonder either way hope you have a great weekend and we'll see you for game face on tuesday